Okay, so David, tell me about your experiences of storytelling in, in the classroom. Well, I've been doing it for quite a few years now, and, and in every kind of classroom as well, not just with young learners, but a lot with adults. I mean, where I teach at the moment with adults in an academic context, and even there, the, the, the chance just to bring a story into an occasional class somehow is not only brings the group together and makes a community out of the group that I'm working with, but it's a very, very valuable aspect of, I think, first and foremost, listening. And if they're listening to me tell mm. a story, the class are very united and they feel that they're being given something very personal and very special. I mean, they treasure the stories that they're given. But the great thing about storytelling as well is the, the reciprocal nature, because what I find is that the more I start telling stories in class, the more likely it is that students will come back and want to tell a story themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm, you know, I teach in a, in a mixed nationality context, and the students I work with all come from um, cultures where storytelling was very, has been very, uh, very much, hasn't been lost in the same way as it was lost and regained the oral traditional storytelling in the UK. It's kind of been, we're in a kind of resurgent state in the UK. Mm -hmm. But I teach a lot of students at the moment from China and from um, Arabic speaking countries who, it's stories are, are seen so much part of their upbringing through family that they just, they, they just start to pour out of them. And they, initially they tell, well, it's when we were children. Mm -hmm. But then when they start to tell them, as they start to tell them, they realise that they're actually they're very many layered, and they were and they're, they're seeing the stories often in a new light, as if um, things that they, they didn't discover before. Not just the simple moral, but sometimes what it's saying about the identity that they have and the culture that they come from, and how it compares with the other students around them. Mm -hmm. And on a on a more language learning level, I mean, storytelling is great, not just for listening, but working with pronunciation. A lot, a lot of the storytelling I do is very interactive, so students might join in by chorally repeating that it's kind of discrete drilling. Mm -hmm. But also things like um, giving advice. Maybe, they'll, maybe I'll stop in the middle of a story, and as a character in the story, I'll suddenly become a character in the story and, and mm -hmm. ask them for advice of what I should do next. Mm -hmm. And that leads into wonderful opportunities for role play. So the big thing I'm interested in at the moment are response tasks. So as soon as we've finished a story, as soon as I've told a story, I'm asking students how to respond creatively to the story. So very little interest in comprehension check. I don't mind if they've actually misheard sometimes and got the wrong end of the stick. I'm much more interested in what, what it made them feel like, what images came into their head. Um, and students reveal a lot about who they are as you know, in their identity, but also their way of learning and their way of thinking. Yesterday, I told a story I'd learned from uh, a Shona-speaking guy from Mozambique to a group of teachers. And afterwards, I inquired about their experience. And there was a woman uh, called Vani in, in, from India. And in her imagination, she completely relocated this, for me, what was a Southern African story, mm into rural um, Punjab culture and she had the, the clothing and the, the, the she, he had images of the landscape that she came from in her, in her mind mm -hmm. so it's kind of fascinating when you get students as well in the class talking to each other about what, what they imagine some of them are imagining it as a cartoon while others are seeing it you know, located in, in close to their own home or, or some of them are feel like they're part of the story and they become one of the kind of protagonists in the story and get very excited. That happens a lot with kids. I mean, I do a lot of storytelling with, with children aged from four upwards. And very often, they will really have a strong physical experience in storytelling. They'll want to do gestures and actions along with me. I do a lot of action stories with young learners. But then they all want to act out the story immediately, and I'll do a lot of drama and role play and making tableaus and moving images and bringing them to life and making them bigger. And, and it's a, just a wonderful platform for, for creativity. It's like a launch pad for so many possibilities. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
I'm, at, I'm actually at an international teaching conference, IATFL, at the moment. And yesterday, I went into the fish and chip shop on the seafront, and I got chatting, because everybody is obvious who's, who's around from the conference. There was a, a woman called Yasmina from Istanbul. And as I do, when I meet students, teachers, after a short conversation, I'll say... Have you anyone's got a story that you could give me that I might be able to tell to other people? And people are very, very willing to tell you a story if they've got one in their head. And she immediately said, well, there's lots of jokes from northern Turkey, like very short stories. And I said, oh, you mean stories about, like, Nasruddin Hodja? And she said, oh, that's slightly different. Nasruddin Hodja stories from, uh, from Anatolia, but these, these stories from the north of Turkey where people are very witty. They love their jokes. So I said, well, tell me the story, and, 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 it, and this is the story she gave me. Um, a Turkish man wanted to make a new life in the United States. So he flew across the Atlantic and landed, and he was met by his host at the airport. And he was led through the airport, and there they got to his car, and he said, my, your car is big. Well, you know, everything is big in America. So he got into the car and they drove through the streets and they came to his house and... Oh, your house is big! Why, everything is big in America. And he went inside and he sat him down at the table and there was this huge table with a fine spread of food. I mean, huge portions. And he began to eat and... Why, this table is big! Why, everything is big in America. Having eaten so much, he said... I, I, could you show me the, the washroom? Yeah, it's down the corridor. Turn left. Well, he was so full of all these new images and impressions. He went down the corridor, but he turned right. And he found himself there in front of the swimming pool. And before he knew it, he had tripped and fallen and was there swimming, floundering in the water. And he called out as loud as he could... Please don't pull the flush! <laughs>